we're going to pick up again where we left off last week and um, continue on our study. Let me uh, bring you up to date to where we are right now. Father, bless the study of your word. Give me wisdom, Lord, and give me the gift of teaching. And our Father, I pray that you give the people hearts to hear and receive the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Now, in Scripture, you have uh, three, uh, three, uh, three names or three designations for the devil. One is Lucifer in Isaiah 14. And the other is Satan. When the Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan addressed him personally. And the third one is a, is a generic term, simply means or simply says devil. All right. Devil is translated from the Greek diablos, which means a slanderer or an accuser. Satan is a transliteration. It's not a translation. It's simply taken from the text and taken over into English. It is a Hebrew word because Satan shows up in the, in the Old Testament time and time again. And sometimes it is translated and sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's translated and says adversary or what have you like that. But then sometimes not. So it is the name of the devil, Satan. But then there is another name that shows up in the Bible, and that name is Lucifer. In Isaiah chapter number 14, the, name, the word Lucifer is a Latin word. And that word means a shining one or a bright one. Or literally, Lucifer means a bearer of light. Now, in the book of Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse number 12, the Hebrew word Hillel shows up. One time in the Old Testament, one time right there, Isaiah chapter 14. That in itself is remarkable because it shows that the Holy Spirit is giving you that word and associating that word with this fallen creature, Lucifer. And in Isaiah 14, it's talking about his fall from heaven. And uh, the big, doc, the big, uh, the big uh, argument today in the uh, occult world and now coming into the Christian world, and I use the word Christian very lightly, is that Lucifer is not that bad angel that he's been portrayed to be, but rather he's a good angel. And the occult world has always held to this, but now it's coming over into the Christian world. And now this is only getting the foot in the door. The idea is to get you to accept something, a premise. Once you accept that, they build upon it. And that's where the problem comes in. Last week we brought up the NIV and some of the places, the NIV, the translations that it's made. And uh, the reason I did that is because the NIV is essentially the granddaddy of all of these new versions as far as usage is concerned. It's more widely distributed and used than uh, any other translation outside of the Bible. Amen. You know the way I said that. <laughs> but anyway... The NIV is, is the official uh, Bible of, uh, I guess, I don't know if they officially declare it to be a Southern Baptist church, but a lot of people in there use it, but a lot of fundamental Baptists use it too, and a lot of other people use it. I thought you might be interested in some statistics. Now, I'm not one that's, uh, you know, statistics will burn you up and wear you out, but uh, as you, I don't know if you realize it or not, but the NIV has changed considerably since its first incarnation. And to the point to where it is today, which obviously, of course, means that if it has changed up to this point, it will continue to change. And uh, here is a um, here is some statistics that uh, we start with as, as far as NIV of uh, 1984 up into the present. Only 60 percent of the original NIV has been retained. A full 40% has been changed. Uh, the uh, changes can be broken down into books. And I appreciate whoever did this work to gather these uh, statistics together for us. But you can break down the, uh, the changes by every single book of the Bible. Some books of the Bible have far more changes than other books of the Bible. For example... 52%, 52.11% of the book of Revelation is retained. In plainer words, almost half of the book of Revelation has been changed. 
from the original NIV unto its present condition. Now, if I were an NIV fan, I'd be, I'd, I'd be, I'd be wondering today what's going on, wouldn't you? I mean, seriously, if it's a, if the, if it's a better translation, well, then it'll be a better, a better one. It'll be better than the better next week, and then better than the better than the better next week. And it kind of gets you in the situation where, are you an old NIV fan or a new NIV fan? Or what about a mid-NIV fan? Which one are you? You see, they may even begin to squabble among themselves about which NIV is the nearest to the originals when none of them have the originals, never seen them, never will see them. But as they argue among themselves, which one is the, is the most accurate? The King James Bible was kicked out for a Bible in 1984 that has had 40% of its, of its uh, content changed since then. Now think for a minute this morning. Think for a minute. It's hard, it's hard, it would be hard for me to imagine them to hold a straight face when they look at you and tell you that that NIV is better than your King James Bible. Wouldn't you think? Knowing these statistics? But anyway, these, uh, these statistics are quite revealing because they reveal the simple fact that the NIV is a book in, what's the word for it? Transition. It's the transitional uh, translation. That's what it is. E evolving. That's the word. The NIV is evolving. So if you are an NIV fan, you need to make your mind up, which one am I? Am I the original NIV or am I the NIV of today or am I going to be the NIV of tomorrow? And that's the position you're in. Now, if you've got a King James Bible in your hand, you've got the book. The book the way it's always been. And the fact that they have to change this thing and constantly update it and constantly change it uh, is an indication that there is a problem. Now, the NIV in Isaiah chapter number 14 says, and I don't know which one we're reading from. Is it the, is it the, is it the I don't know. <laughs> See, that's where we are now. Right. When you quote the NIV, which NIV are you quoting? <laughs> you know, somebody come in and say, well, you're not quoting my NIV. This is my NIV. It's not your NIV. Well, which one is it? See? When you come in here and we hold up a King James Bible in front of you, you know what I believe. Right. Which one's the book? <laughs> but anyway, it says NIV. So the NIV says, have you, how, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, but you are brought down to the grave. Now, who called himself the bright and morning star? Jesus. The Lord Jesus did. He did. He called himself that. He said, I am the bright and morning star. Now, there is no doubt in my mind that when he spoke and said that, that he was referring to himself personally, that he wasn't saying that I'm the devil and I'm Christ too, but that statement meant that I am the Lord Jesus and I am the bright and I am the morning star. Now, someone did us a great favor. Turn to 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 19. Someone did a great favor for us, great favor. Here's what happens when you start messing around with the Bible. Here's what happens. And this is one you need to make a notation of. And the next time you meet up with an NIV fan, because this one's new. Someone did us a great favor. All right, in 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 19, I'm going to read from the NIV. Now, I don't know which one, but I'm reading from the NIV. Now listen to this. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now hold on just a second. Hold on. In I, the NIV in Isaiah 14, 12 said, O morning star, how art thou fallen from heaven. Do you know what you just read? You just read where the NIV, NIV told you that Lucifer was your reward. That's sick. Amen. But that's what you just read. And there's probably not one out of 10,000 people carrying an NIV today that, can, that know that. That's what it says. It says, and of course, what does the, King, what does the Bible say? Somebody have the Bible open, 2 Peter 1.19. Right, read, read 2 Peter 1.19 from the Bible for me.
Okay. I know who's the day star. That's the Lord Jesus. No question about that. See, the King James Bible uses the term day star there. It also, in Revelation, he said, I am the bright and morning star. Those two terms are directly refer to the Lord Jesus. There is no confusion because when you get to Isaiah 14, the word is Lucifer. See, but the NIV in 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 19 says, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, they may have caught that by now. I don't know. I hope they catch it. Somebody ought to call them up and say, boys, you need to catch this one. You need to, you need to revise this because you're looking real bad. You're telling people that Satan is your reward. That's what it says right here. Now, in Revelation chapter number 2, verses 26 through 28, uh, if any, how many people have a Bible with them today? All right. I'm going to read from the NIV, and you all have a Bible, so you can follow along with me. In, in Revelation chapter number 2, verses 26 through 28. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with, a, with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. Now, of course, I know yours doesn't read that way, but what did I just tell you? What did I just say? See? I know it. And what, what does the Bible say, brother? Read the Bible for us, would you? Second, uh, uh, Revelation 2, verses 26 through 28 from the Bible. Verses 20, 26 through 28. Okay, now, who's talking? Okay, who's the morning star? All right, but now if you've got an NIV, who's the morning star? Lucifer. Let me read the, let me read the NIV. Okay, now watch it. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. Are you, are you getting what this is doing here? Have you caught this yet? Pardon? Okay. I'm reading from an NIV, not a King James Bible. The NIV in Isaiah 14 verse 12 says, who's the morning star? See, once the NIV identifies the morning star as Lucifer, then every time the word morning star shows up again in the NIV, it's talking about who? Lucifer. Exactly. In your King James Bible, there's not a problem because you know who the bright and morning star is. It's not Lucifer. Well, <laughs> the Almighty judges the motive. Yes, sir. Oh, sure it does. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, now, what has happened here? Has this made anything clearer or has it created confusion? In other words, what if you, what if you carry your NIV into your grandmother's house and your grandmother and you want to sit down and read the Bible? And your grandmother is a, is a, is a good, godly saint of God. And she reads her Bible daily. And she opens up her Bible, and you open up your Bible, and you start reading from your NIV, and she says, hold on a minute. What are you reading from? Well, I'm going to read from Isaiah 14, grandmother. And so you read from Isaiah 14 from your, from your NIV or any of the rest of them. They're all about the same. And your grandmother says, now wait just a minute here. We got a problem. We got a problem. We got a big problem. You see what's happened? Are we smarter than our fathers? No. 
when you, if, uh, if you're ever out in the country and you see a fence, it's there for a reason. <laughs> it's there for a reason. <laughs> it really is. There's a reason for those fences. I remember one time I was a kid, my brother and I got inside. We climbed a fence and got into the field. <laughs> and out there, it's like kids playing, you know. And I heard a sound across the hill, and there's this big bull over here. And you wouldn't believe how fast we got back over that fence. Yes, sir. <laughs> That fence there for a reason, isn't it? All right. Now, the sulfurine, and that is a, I know you, you, you wouldn't have reason to know that term, but I've used it in here before. Uh, uh, the sulfurine uh, is a fence to the scripture. What that means is that every word on a page is counted, every letter is counted, its location is counted, and it's set, and the Masorites were the expert in the sulfurim. In plain words, they were the ones who could read it, apply it, use it. And the Masorites put the vowel points in all of these, in all the words, or you wouldn't be able to read them. And when they did that, they handed it down to us, and that is the Masoretic text of the Old Testament, all right? Well, that Masoretic text of the Old Testament is the text that's found with the King James Bible of the New Testament. Now, it's important to understand this. This is a big deal. How many has ever heard of the Septuagint? All right. Now, a lot of you just take, and some of you have never done a lot of study on it. That's okay. I'm not up here to be, to be critical, but I'm trying to say something that's very important. The Septuagint was a supposed translation of the Bible that was made about uh, 300 B.C. Uh, when I say Bible, I'm talking about Old Testament now. A translation of the Old Testament that was made 200, 250, 300, somewhere along in there, in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, how many of you remember what I said about Alexandria, Alexandria, Egypt, how important that place was? That was the library of libraries. Okay, that's the seat of learning. All right. The Septuagint translation of the Old Testament is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, I'm saying this as they say it. Not that I necessarily believe it, because I'm going to say more. But the Septuagint is the so-called translation of the Old Testament by 70, and I think it's 72, or 70, it's been a while since I've read this, 72, 73, 74 Jewish elders translated the Old Testament into Greek. That's why it got the name Septuagint, 70. All right. Now, here's the problem. That Greek, so-called Greek translation of the Old Testament is what they base a lot of the new Bibles on when they come along and translate the Old Testament. They base it on that so-called Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, here's the problem. There is nowhere on the face of this earth that anybody can find, first of all, a Greek translation of the Old Testament in situ. That's the term they mean. That simply means extant. It means that you can lay your hand on it. It doesn't exist like that. It exists in pieces here, pieces there. But they can find a document written by a man named Origen Adamantius. And how many's ever heard of Origen? All right, now he's a real historical character. Uh, and he lived, uh, he, was, he was what you would call one of the apostolic fathers because he, he lived right near the time of John the Apostle. He lived about 150 to 200 A.D. He took a thing that's called, they, they call it the hexapla. It's a document like this that has five hex, five. It has five columns of scripture. One of those columns is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. It is the fifth column of Origen's hexapla. That is the so-called Septuagint. It is that fifth column of Origen's hexapla that they use to say, well, here is the Septuagint. Well, the Septuagint exists exist in Origen's hexapla. But as far as the Septuagint existing outside of it, nobody can find that. And here's the problem with the new Bibles and the new translations. They base the changes on this Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, here's the difference. Here's the difference. The Hebrew that you have, the Hebrew Bible that's translated into English, that you have in a King James Bible, 
is a Hebrew Bible that is translated using Masoretic vowel points supplied to us, thank God, by the Masoretes about 1,000 A.D., 1,100, 900, anywhere from a period along about, there's a two to 300 year period there that nobody can nail it down exactly, even up to 1150, and I've, I've seen some dates as high as 12 A.D., that these Masoretes, the school of Masoretes, put the vowel points in the Hebrew Old Testament Instead of the Septuagint now, we've got a Hebrew Old Testament with Hebrews, Jews, putting vowel points in it. And with the vowel points, we can pronounce the words, therefore we can translate them. See what I mean? Now, do you see the difference? Do you see the difference between the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, and the, and the, and the Masoretic uh, vowel points on the Hebrew text of the Old Testament? So the Bible says that the oracles of God were given in Romans chapter number 9. To who? To the Jew. All right. The King James translators could have made a choice because it existed in their day for certain because Origen Adamantius goes all the way back to 150, 200 A.D. That they could have, they could have, they could have chosen the so-called Septuagint, but they rejected it. They kicked it out. The King James translators kicked it out entirely, said, no, we're going to take the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Masoretic vowel points, of the Hebrew Bible, and that's what we're going to translate the Word of God from. And so they did. And they did the same thing when it came to the Greek manuscripts that the King James Bible were translated from. Instead of taking the Alexandrian text from North Africa, which is the, the Vaticanus, the Sinaiticus, the Alexandrinius, uh, and also from North Africa, Something else came, which is, which is most people have never heard of this or had no idea that it even existed. A place in Egypt, which is North Africa, Egypt is, Alexandria is in Egypt. A place in Egypt is called Nag Hammadi. How many ever heard of that? All right, a few of you have. That's done a little stuff. Nag Hammadi. Well, let me tell you what they found there. They found Gnostic Gospels. Elaine Pagels has a book about that thick, and I've got it in my office, where she, she makes the argument that the Gnostic Gospels are more, uh, 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 more true to the truth of who Christ was than the, than, the, than the Orthodox Scripture. And they always do. I mean, it's, it's, always, it's a cat and mouse game. They're always coming in here picking and pecking away at your Bible. But the Gnostic Gospels were found of all places. They weren't found in Antioch of Syria. See? They weren't found in Jerusalem. They were found in North Africa, in Egypt, Alexandria, the place. How many ever heard of Philo of Alexandria? Philo, all right. Philo lived in a period of time when, when Judaism, if you want to call it that, and I guess you would because the Apostle Paul said, I profited in the Jews' religion, and the Jews' religion was not the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was the Babylonian faith handed to them through the Talmud. But Philo of Alexandria was one of these men who was well-read, well-learned. He was from Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, here's a man who a lot of people, do, even to this day, they use him to, for interpretation and historical analysis and so forth. But Philo of Alexandria, uh, he, was, he, was, he was into this, into this, into this uh, you, how many ever heard of Plato? All right, all right. How many ever heard of Neoplatonism? That's new Platonism, all right. The golden age of Greece produced people who believe that that there, there are successive steps to God. Okay, it's called demiurges. It's this successive steps. All kinds of, of esoteric, mysterious worlds and spirits and all of this stuff. Well, Philo of Alexandria was deep into that. So is Gnosticism. So is North Africa. So is Alexandria of North Africa. And so these Gnostic Gospels, Philo of Alexandria, Alexandria in uh, uh, Egypt, it's all a hotbed of Gnosticism and a hotbed of esoteric, which means inward. Exoteric is outward. Esoteric is Hinduism. Esoteric is the New Age movement. Esoteric is saying that Lucifer and Christ are the same. Esoteric is teaching that before men were ever made on this earth, they were spirit beings in heaven. And that... That, and, and that some of them fell from their heavenly father, and one of them that fell from their heavenly father was Lucifer. Esoteric doctrine gets real flaky, but that's where it came from. It came from North Africa. It came from this place. And these were the manuscripts produced by these people. These manuscripts produced by them were the ones used 
to create these new Bibles. That's the source of the NIV, the New American Standard Version, the Good News for Modern Man, the, uh, the old granddaddy of all of it, 1889, the Revised Version that I told you last week about Westcott and Hort, the two that got into the Revision Committee. I told you how that up until that point in time that there had simply been two basic lines of manuscripts, one Roman Catholic and the other Protestant. And uh, if you don't believe that the Roman Catholic manuscripts are mystical, do just a little bit of research into Ignatius Loyola. How many's ever heard of him? All right. Ignatius Loyola was the man who in the, in the 14, 1500s, somewhere along in there, founded the Jesuit order in the Roman Catholic Church. The Jesuit general today Today now, the Jesuit general is called the Black Pope. The reason he's called that is because he passes, he, 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 he lives from one pope through the next pope through the next pope or whatever. He's not public like the pope is, but he has enormous power in the background. And I don't know if you've ever really thought much about it or not. Just do a little bit of digging and you'll find that the Roman Catholic Church is one of the most mystical places on the face of the earth. They have produced more mystics than, than you could ever imagine. And I believe that there are Roman Catholics who are saved. I believe there are Roman Catholics who love the Lord. But I believe it, they're in spite. It's got to be in spite of what they're taught and what comes out of their church. You're coming to here, listen, you're coming down to 2011. We're at the tail end of a lot of history. It, every, all that stuff just didn't pop up overnight. This business about Bible, Bible uh, manuscripts, about translations, all this argument, dogfighting that's going on about this, this didn't happen. This didn't start with the NIV. This has been going on for a long time, but it's like a dovetail. It's coming now to a point. It's reaching that point to where a satanic Bible will be produced that will completely change the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ and they will receive a false Christ in his place. And the groundwork has been laid for a long time. Now this little lady right here, Gail Ripplinger, she was a professor at Kent State University. How many remember where the National Guard opened fire on those kids up there in the 60s or somewhere back in there? These, these, these ill-trained National Guard troops playing soldier on the weekend. Uh, I don't know that they were attacked. Did anybody ever see anything where they were attacked? Here they are armed, and they opened fire on armed, uh, you know, unarmed kids. Uh, but anyway, she was a professor in that college, and she wrote this book. And, and the, if you ever picked up a piece of literature that is as unbiased and objective as it can be, it's this. And the reason is because she had... She had no previous training. She's a, she was a professor. I forget exactly what she, what she taught her subjects were at Kent State. But she knew that the kids that came to her for counseling that had a King James Bible were getting more help and more support than the ones that had an NIV and the other Bibles. And, she, and, and for her own uh, not, uh, inquiry, her own knowledge, because she wanted to know, she made her own study. This is the work of somebody who started out, just like uh, Ben-Hur was written by, what's his name, Lou Wallace? So down through the past, so many of these people who have written outstanding works were atheists and agnostics that set about to disprove the existence of the Lord Jesus Christ, wound up the, some of the greatest believers that ever lived. <laughs> you know why? Because when they got in there and started digging up the evidence, they found out, I'm a fool for being an atheist, and I'm a fool for being an agnostic. Christ did live. Well, this is what's happening here. This woman, I'm not saying was an atheist or an agnostic, but she wanted to know the truth, and she found it, and she has continued to write since then. Now, this is a smart woman. She's very smart. This is a very smart lady. She has an analytical mind, and she's able to dig into stuff and pull out a motive behind what's going on. She can take the facts, lay them out, and find a pattern what's happening here. And here's the pattern. You want to hear it? You want to find out where this is leading? This is, her, this is her summary. This is what she says is going on. Now, she gives us five things. 
And she says that the world is being initiated, especially the church. It's being initiated. It's being prepared to receive Satan. All right. And she goes through the steps. The following five steps represent Satan's progressive and gradual image transforming campaign. Now, I've said a lot up until this point to tell you how that Lucifer, Satan, and the devil are three terms, words, <laughs> as I believe, referring to the same individual. But there's a big dog fight about all of that. Okay. Step one, the denial of the existence of Satan. This is the first step, all right, to deny the existence of Satan. There's no devil. Now, here's what Albert Pike said. Satan is not a person but a force. Blavatsky in the Isis Unveiled, the secret doctrine, this is a Russian woman back in the 1900s uh, uh, in uh, the, uh, here she's writing about, this is, this is occultism, but here's what she says. The devil is a metaphysical abstractation. There, never ha there have never been any devils or disobedient angels. Blavatsky. Here's Carr on Lucifer, the, the Lucifer connection. According to the New Age doctrine, Satan is a mere collective thought form, and the church is shot full of New Age doctrine today. Any church that is practicing yoga, which will lead to kundalini yoga, which will lead to demon possession, is definitely into the metaphysical, the supernatural. The, the, uh, the, uh, there's another term for it. I can't think of it right now. And climber, the science of the soul. The devil is the flesh and its desires. You see how he's made it an abstract thing? The flesh and its desires. That's the devil. Fillmore, metaphysical Bible dictionary. Devil, the mass of thoughts that fight against the truth. Not an individual person. It's like this. The liberals have taught... In, in the colleges and universities, all the way back to Graf and Wellhausen, all the way back to German rationalism in the 1800s, they have taught that Christ is not a real person who rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father. They teach that the Christ spirit, see, came upon him, comes upon you, and that that's what gets the work done. In plain words, not a person, an individual, but, a, but, a, but, a, but an idea, a thought, that's what they teach. This same Jesus that, that that angel said, remember? This same Jesus will come again as you've seen him go. Not a, not a thought, not an idea, not a purpose, not a principle, Amen. not a movement, not a way, but the person. When you're born again, you're not saved by believing a bunch of thoughts, by receiving a spiritual uh, inspiration, by, by receiving, by receiving uh, you know, a movement or becoming part of something. You are born again by receiving a living person. Amen. Amen. You receive a resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, now that's the difference between the metaphysical. Now here's step two. The assertion that Lucifer and the devil are separate and distinct entities. Now can't you see that? Can't you see what I've been kind of, I've spent a lot of time on this? All right. One Luciferian confesses, it must be recognized that he takes mighty precautions against being recognized as the prince of darkness. <laughs> Tex Mars, how many's ever heard of this fellow? Why then is the world still confused about the Luciferic roots of the New Age? In part, this comes about as a result of the New Ager's absurd contention that though Lucifer is Lord, he is not Satan. Satan is said to be a figment of the Christian imagination. Lucifer is not Satan. Lucifer is a good angel. Now, Tex Mars is not saying that that's what he believes. He's just reporting that that's what they teach. All right. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not, <laughs> I don't want you to misunderstand. All right. Lucifer is a good angel. Is he really? You don't know who he is if you've got an NIV. Do you have an old NIV, a new NIV, or a middle NIV? Which one have you got? Carr, the Lucifer connection. The Lucifer of the New Age is not the Lucifer of the Bible. Lucifer is thus misidentified and given a positive image in the New Age. New Age believers have divorced Satan and Lucifer. Many of them believe that Satan is a myth, remember, invented by the church 
in the Middle Ages. Somebody say, what's that got to do with me? Your children may wind up going to a church like that. That's what it's got to do with you. That's what it's got to do with you. That's what it's got to do with you. Or your mother, your father, or your, or your husband, or your wife. And Albert Pike, as we have quoted extensively, Yes, Lucifer is God. The doctrine of Satanism is a heresy. And the true and pure philosophic religion, I'm glad you said that, Mr. Pike. The true and pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer. You may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Well, was Albert Pike then a Luciferian? Well, by his own admission, he is. No question about it. Now, how many of you have ever used a Bible dictionary? All right. There's some good ones and some not so good ones. And uh, the new Bible dictionaries have jumped right on the bandwagon. The International Bible Dictionary, edited by F.F. F. Bruce, Here's the citation heading for Lucifer or Isaiah 14. It is inappropriate to think, it, it, it is inappropriate to the passage to think Satan is meant. That's a Bible dictionary. If you're a Bible, if you're a young convert and you want to know what's going on in Isaiah 14 and you pick up the International Bible Commentary and read what F.F. F. Bruce says, he tells you that that's not the devil. So what are you going to do? You know, you're young in the faith and you don't have any, you don't have any roots. You don't have any real foundation. You don't have any, 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 uh, any research behind you. So what are you going to do? You're going to have to listen to people who you think know what they're talking about. That's what happens. Harper's Bible Dictionary. The connection was made erroneously between Lucifer and Satan. Was it really? Erdman's, the Bible Dictionary. Lucifer is not included in this dictionary. They refer the reader from Lucifer to Day Star, Jesus Christ, saying, Another name for Morning Star. 2 Peter 1.19, Revelation 2.28, Some commentators link the idea with an ancient myth about the banishment of a divine person, a runaround confusion. Smith Bible Dictionary, from Jerome downward, it referred to Satan. See what they've done? They've planted doubt in your mind because Jerome's Latin Vulgate is not the old Latin Vulgate. In the New, the new Standard Bible Dictionary, Funk and Wagnall, editor W. Jacobs, Lucifer is not included. They refer to the reader to Daystar, which states, applied to Lucifer and Christ. The New Standard Bible Dictionary. And some of you may have some of these in your, in your house. If you do, be warned. You know, arm yourself with knowledge. And when you get into this stuff, know what you're dealing with. Dictionary of the Bible, Macmillan published, Mackenzie's the editor, Lucifer's not included. Who's who in the Old Testament? Joan Connery, Lucifer is not included. On it goes. Interpreters, one volume commentary of the Bible. The theme of the downfall is vividly elongated in a mythological picture. The tyrant is likened to the day star. Blasphemy. The day, who's the day star? They just told you that this is, a uh, this is a myth and that it is likened to the day star. Isaiah 14 has nothing to do with the day star. Yes, sir. Does it? Now, how many, how many remember what I told you that this was called? Venus. All right? Venus is the, is, is not a star. Of course, it's a planet in our planetary system. But Venus has the unique, the unique position in the heavens that it goes to bed at night and it comes up in the morning. I don't, how, I don't know how the put, other way to put it. In plain words, it disappears at night. It goes to bed. But then it rises in the morning right before the sun comes up. See, that's why it's called the bright morning star. It, you see it coming up, and it's the brightest star in the cloud, in the heavens. So it's called the morning star. Well, the Bible said, be not dismayed with the heavens as the, as the heathen are, right? They're trying to say that the King James Bible translators didn't know about Venus. They didn't know what the word Lucifer means. They didn't know all of this, and therefore they were fooled by a bunch of pagan 
a doctrine and ideas. That's the whole point here. The King James Bible translators use the word Lucifer because Lucifer is a light bearer. And that Latin word, that Latin word, Lucifer, probably, and I haven't had time to do it. I've tried to do a little etymology on this thing. Some of you might want to do it. Etymology. That's a powerful tool. What is it? It is searching out the source, the beginning, the roots of a word. And watch how it changes as it moves from one language to another and as it progresses in time. Here's what you're going to get. If you type in the word Lucifer in your computer, they're going to run you straight to Rome. They're going to run you to the Latin. They're going to run you back to the Latin language. Latin language. And they're going to say, they're going to tell you that Lucifer is Latin and it means light bearer. Well, it does. That's true. But that's not all of it. You see what I mean? Where'd the word come from? Say, what's the root of it? And you might be surprised what you find when you get into stuff like this. All right? So now, step four. Lucifer's true identity as Satan is revealed using the anagram, a transposition of letters, to obscure it. And this gets into, this, is, this is, gets real scary here because this is, this is what's going on right now. Now, we know that rock metal, rock hard, rock metal, uh, rock bands, uh, hard heavy metal bands, and all this stuff have been using 666, Satan, Satan is Lord, all this stuff now for decades. We know that. But they're not new with anything. All they're doing is just rehashing what's already been said, what's already been used, that predates all of them. The, uh, here's, what, uh, here's what she says. The gods of the New Age include... Sanatan, Sanat Siyata, the Hindu sons of Brahman, and San Tisita, it is Satan of the Buddhist, shown holding a white lotus. The shade trees of the Bible are also turning into lotus plants in new versions. This is her interjected a little bit there. New Agers say each name is concealed anagrammically. All right, this is for the initiate. Every symbol has a meaning. It has two meanings. Every symbol has two meanings. It has a meaning for the mob and it has a meaning for the initiate. Every word has two meanings. It has a meaning for the goyim, the mob, the useless eaters as, as, uh, as uh, the one that started, what's her name, uh, started the Planned Parenthood. Uh, no, uh, Sanger, Margaret Sanger. Useless eaters, it's for the useless eaters or, it is, it, or you're the initiate. They can communicate with each other. I don't know if you've noticed it or not yet. It's popping up everywhere. I see more and more of it every day of these logos. You all know what a logo is. You see a logo. That, that is copyright protection in the court of law, a logo. And in these logos, they're starting to show the yin and the yang. The yin yang's popping up. And the pentagram's popping up, and other symbols are starting to pop up all over our country in the logos of these, of these, of these corporations. Some of, them are, some of them are multinational corporations. What are they doing? They're laying the groundwork so that in the future, if something is called or something is done, they can immediately recognize one of their own. That's what that has to do with. Not only that, but every symbol has a connection to a spiritual power behind it. The Apostle Paul says, I would not have you worship devils. He said, the table of the Lord, which is our Lord's Supper, we take that. We know what that represents, don't we? He said, but when you are drinking wine, when you're taking the table of, the, of, of, of a pagan, dealing with them in their pagan rituals and in their world, he said, that wine is nothing that idol is nothing, but there is a demon behind that idol. It is attached to something, and there is. Words are powerful things. When you give out a word, God said the word was made flesh. You are saved by believing the truth of the word of God. 
an anagram that we're talking about is just the transposition of a couple of letters to change the appearance of what it means, but they know exactly what it means. They're communicating with each other. That communication is going on today. Now, whether a head of state is conscious of what's going on in the background or over his head is irrelevant. It doesn't make any difference. One of the smartest men in the world said years ago, he said, I don't care who your president is. I don't care who your king is. I don't care who your leader is. You give me the purse strings, the money, and I will control any country I want to. A super committee is meeting right now. How many is on that super committee? Twelve? Twelve people are meeting right now to determine how they're going to cut 1.5, 1.7, what is it? trillion dollars uh, from the deficit, a super committee, all right? It is said the United States of America, this is for public consumption, I don't know how close and accurate this is, that the United States right now is $15 trillion in debt. Now let me say it another way. It is $15,000 billion in debt. If you spent a million dollars every day of your life for 2,000 years, 2,000 years, if you spent a million dollars every day for 2,000 years, you wouldn't touch a trillion dollars. Go figure it out. I think it comes out to about three quarters of a trillion. Imagine that. 2,000 years of a million dollars every day, and you haven't touched, touched a trillion. We owe 15 trillion. What's that mean, preacher? Somebody's pulling, the, somebody's, somebody's pulling the purse strings. Why are all these jobs leaving this country? Why are all of the, of the, of the manufacturing jobs leaving our country? Why are, the, why are all the good jobs leaving our country? Why is this going on? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's treason. It's traitor. They're going to make the country vulnerable to the international bankers, to the people who pull the purse strings. Something else you need to think about, who do you owe that $15 trillion to? And think about something else, a private corporation for profit, and that's exactly who the Fed is. It's a private corporation for profit is dispersing the money, flooding it into the economy. If a dollar bill is worth a dollar bill today and will buy so much, tomorrow there's 10,000 million dollar bills just like it. It won't be worth near as much as it was today, will it? No. That's what's happening. Somebody's taken over. Amen. I've got my money in a safe place. I got all my treasures laid up somewhere else. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I didn't have to lay much up anyway. I didn't have much to start with. <laughs> all right. Well, that word prayer. Yes, sir. Yeah, I saw that, brother. And that's a good thing you bring it. Why would they knowingly use such a symbol? Yeah. How would you all like it if you saw my Bible and I had Baphomet on the front of it here? If you don't know who that is, go look it up. It'll turn your stomach. Bahomet, B-A-H-O-M-E-T, I think it is, something like that. Alistair, just type Alistair Crowley, type that in, plus Bahomet. I may not be pronouncing it correctly, and see what it pulls up. Androgyny, a union of two, male and female, and one of the most wicked things that's ever been devised from a human mind. Amen. All right. Brother Rue, yeah, dismiss We're going to pick up again where we left off last week and um, continue on our study. Let me uh, bring you up to date to where we are right now. Father, bless the study of your word. Give me wisdom, Lord, and give me the gift of teaching. And our Father, I pray that you give the people hearts to hear and receive the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Now... 
In Scripture, you have uh, three, uh, three, uh, three names or three designations for the devil. One is Lucifer in Isaiah 14. The other is Satan. When the Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan addressed him personally. And the third one is, is a generic term, simply means or simply says devil. All right. Devil is translated from the Greek diablos, which means a slanderer or an accuser. Satan is a transliteration. It's not a translation. It's simply taken from the text and taken over into English. It is a Hebrew word because Satan shows up in the, in the Old Testament time and time again. And sometimes it is translated and sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's translated and says adversary or what have you like that. But then sometimes not. So it is the name of the devil, Satan. But then there is another name that shows up in the Bible and that name is Lucifer in Isaiah chapter number 14. The name, the word Lucifer is a Latin word. And that word means a shining one or a bright one or literally Lucifer means a bearer of light. Now, in the book of Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse number 12, the Hebrew word Hillel shows up one time in the Old Testament. One time right there, Isaiah chapter 14. That in itself is remarkable because it shows that the Holy Spirit is giving you that word and associating that word with this fallen creature. Lucifer. And in Isaiah 14, it's talking about his fall from heaven. And uh, the big, doc, the big, uh, the big uh, argument today in the uh, occult world and now coming into the Christian world, and I use the word Christian very lightly, is that Lucifer is not that bad angel that he's been portrayed to be, but rather he's a good angel and the occult world has always held to this, but now it's coming over into the Christian world. And now this is only getting the foot in the door. The idea is to get you to accept something or premise. Once you accept that, they build upon it. And that's where the problem comes in. Last week we brought up the NIV and some of the places, the NIV, the translations that it's made. And uh, the reason I did that is because the NIV is essentially the granddaddy of all of these new versions as far as usage is concerned. It's more widely distributed and used than uh, any other translation outside of the Bible. Amen. You know the way I said that. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> the NIV is, is the official uh, Bible of, uh, uh, I guess, I don't know if they officially declare it to be, the Southern Baptist Church, but a lot of... Well, then it'll be a better, a better one. It'll be better than the better next week. And then better than the better than the better next week. And it kind of gets you in the situation where, are you an old NIV fan or a new NIV fan? Or what about a mid-NIV fan? Which one are you? You see, they may even begin to squabble among themselves about which NIV is the nearest to the originals when none of them have the originals. Never seen them, never will see them. But... As they argue among themselves, which one is the, is the most accurate? The King James Bible was kicked out for a Bible in 1984 that has had 40% of its, of its uh, content changed since then. Now think for a minute this morning. Think for a minute. It's hard, it's hard, it would be hard for me to imagine for them to hold a straight face when they look at you and tell you that that NIV is better than your King James Bible. Wouldn't you think, knowing these statistics? But anyway, these, uh, these statistics are quite revealing because they reveal the simple fact that the NIV is a book in, what's the word for it? Transition. It's the transitional uh, translation. That's what it is. E evolving. That's the word. The NIV is evolving. So if you are an NIV fan, you need to make your mind up, which one am I? Am I the original NIV or am I the NIV of today or am I going to be the NIV of tomorrow? And that's the position you're in. Now, if you've got a King James Bible in your hand, you've got the book. The book the way it's always been. And the fact that they have to change this thing and constantly update it and constantly change it uh, is an indication that there is a problem. Now, the NIV in Isaiah chapter number 14 says, and I don't know which one we're reading from. Is it the, is it the, is it the I don't know. 
Right. See, that's where we are now. Right. When you quote the NIV, which NIV are you quoting? <laughs> you know, somebody come in and say, well, you're not quoting my NIV. This is my NIV. It's not your NIV. Well, which one is it? See, when you come in here and we hold up a King James Bible in front of you, you know what I believe. Right. Which one's the book? <laughs> but anyway, it says NIV. So the NIV says, have you, how, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. Son of the dawn, but you are brought down to the grave. Now, who called himself the bright and morning star? The Lord Jesus did. He did. He called himself that. He said, I am the bright and morning star. Now, there is no doubt in my mind that when he spoke and said that, that he was referring to himself personally, that he wasn't saying that I'm the devil and I'm Christ too, but that statement meant that I am the Lord Jesus and I am the bright and I am the morning star. Now, someone did us a great favor. Turn to 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 19. Someone did a great favor for us. Great favor. Here's what happens when you start messing around with the Bible. Here's what happens. And this is one you need to make a notation of. And the next time you meet up with an NIV fan, because this one's new. Someone did us a great favor. All right, in 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 19, I'm going to read from the NIV. Now, I don't know what people in there use it, but a lot of fundamental Baptists use it too, and a lot of other people use it. I thought you might be interested in some statistics. Now, I'm not one that's, uh, you know, statistics will burn you up and wear you out, but uh, as you, I don't know if you realize it or not, but the NIV has changed considerably since its first incarnation. And to the point to where it is today, which obviously, of course, means that if it has changed up to this point, it will continue to change. And uh, here is a um, here is some of the statistics that uh, we start with as, as far as NIV of uh, 1984 up into the present. Only 60 percent of the original NIV has been retained. A full 40% has been changed. Uh, the uh, changes can be broken down into books. And I appreciate whoever did this work to gather these uh, statistics together for us. But you can break down the, uh, the changes by every single book of the Bible. Some books of the Bible have far more changes than other books of the Bible. For example... 52%, 52.11% of the book of Revelation is retained. In plain words, almost half of the book of Revelation has been changed from the original NIV unto its present condition. Now, if I were an NIV fan, I'd be, I'd, I'd be, I'd be wondering today what's going on, wouldn't you? I mean, seriously, if it's a, if the, if it's a better translation, 